All right. Welcome to Scribal 101. This is uh, everything you never knew about scrolls when we're afraid to ask. And for some of you, it'll be everything you already know about scrolls um, and just are seeing in a different format. <laughs> So our agenda for this class is uh, we're going to start by just talking about some basics of scrolls in the SCA, what they are, what they're for, how they're sort of produced and, and handed out. We'll get into some common types of scroll art uh, with examples. I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the materials involved in making scrolls in the SCA and how to get started and then end up with some additional resources. And you'll see throughout the presentation that there are examples of scrolls, or in this case, just an illumination. And a, um, I have captioned pretty much all of them. If you say one without a caption, it's mine. And I just didn't get around to putting my name on it. <laughs> you will see a lot of my scrolls in here. That's not because I'm super egotistical about my scroll making ability, quite the opposite. In fact, it's just that those are the ones I had easy access to and didn't have to ask for permission for. <laughs> So let's begin with the very basics. <laughs> what is a scroll? And I, you know, I promised this was pitched to people who knew nothing about scrolls. So I'm going to start with the most basic, basic information here. What is a scroll? So when you think of a scroll in medieval terms or in SCA terms, very often this, um, this graphic that's here on the left, the clip art there, is what you think of. You know, maybe somebody standing in a town square, you know, holding a you know, yellowed piece of paper saying, oh yay, oh yay, and, uh, you know, announcing some kind of thing. Uh, that, by the way, would almost never have been done. Parchment was extremely, extremely expensive, and you would never just give it to your town crier. You would make them memorize the message, but <laughs> I digress. Uh, you might think of the one in the middle, um, and that is actually a, a Torah, um, so, uh, which are still uh, created using many of the, the techniques that uh, that have been developed through time. Cindy, welcome. Um, we are recording this, so if you don't want your, your face on the recording, be sure to turn your camera off. But if you don't mind leaving it on, that's great too. Uh, and then the last one on the, the right-hand side here is uh, what also what you may think of, you know, or, or certainly if you've seen SCA scrolls, you'll see that they, they look a little more like this and a little less like the other things. Uh, and that's because that's not actually a scroll. That is a page out of a book. Uh, and that's actually where we draw most of our inspiration for SCA scrolls from. And I'll show you more examples of that in a minute. So what is a scroll? Well, it's almost, it's, it's all of these things and it's none of these things. In the SCA, a scroll is a document that is uh, created by artists of the SCA uh, that usually, but not always, uh, accompanies an award. So, um, we have an award system in the SCA whereby, you know, by gaining prowess or getting better in uh, fighting or in the arts or in service, you may catch the notice of the king and queen or of your baron and baroness, if you're in a barony, and they may decide to recognize your achievement with an award. And different kingdoms have different awards, and I certainly won't get into all of those. But um, almost always those awards are going to be accompanied by a scroll, and that's just the document of that award presented to that person. Um, scrolls are often also given to winners of fighting tournaments or of various competitions. You know, maybe there's an arts and sciences competition or a chess tournament or something like that. And uh, the winner will often be presented with a scroll marking that achievement as well. Um, people create scrolls as arts and sciences entries in fairs sometimes. Um, so you'll see people recreate a particular medieval document or a page out of a book of hours, something like that. And they'll enter those into arts and sciences competitions and try to win prizes, which may also include a scroll, which is ironic. <laughs> and then sometimes scrolls are just given for kind of thanks or other purposes. You know, you might see very small um, illuminated pages, painted pages given as, as thank you notes from the majesties or something like that. So, you can see scrolls pop up in other places, but you know, mostly they're for awards or um, maybe tournament winners. So is everybody clear on kind of what a scroll, what function a scroll serves in the SCA? If you're not, you're gonna have to sing out or uh, hit me up in the chat because I can't see your faces, most of you. <laughs> All right. 
So we'll start by talking about, um, again, the, the most common type of, of scroll in the SDA, which is the award scroll. Now, different kingdoms are going to handle these in different ways. And so most of what I'm talking about today is going to be how Primaris uh, obviously handles things and also how Meridius handles things, because that's the, the, the scribal community I kind of grew up in. So I know a lot about that process. Uh, so this uh, picture here is an example of uh, an award scroll blank that I created for the Kingdom of Trimeris. This is for one of our fighting awards called the Lion Door, which is a, um, uh, an award that's given sometimes for sort of conspicuous gallantry or, or fighting spirit you know, at, at a particular event. So um, if the crown sees somebody just going for it, they might uh, stop the fighting and give this award or, or choose to recognize it later in the day. So uh, uh, since this award in particular is often given very spur of the moment, uh, it's quite important to have what we call scroll blanks available for it. Now in some kingdoms, scroll blanks are handled uh, through what's called preprints and they're basically very high quality Xeroxes or copies of um, awards that are then um, most often hand painted um, and then the calligraphy might be already included or calligraphy might be added afterwards. And I'll talk a little bit more about that process too. Um, so, so like I said, so some kingdoms will uh, have those preprints. Um, a lot of kingdoms now are moving to giving all custom scrolls and all custom doesn't necessarily mean that they are individually generated for each person, but it does mean that rather than using those copies and, and painting them in, um, that we're creating individual scrolls for each uh, each instance. So this blank, and it obviously isn't blank, that's a uh, scribery term, <laughs> uh, does not have the name filled in. You'll see uh, we the Crown Trimeris would haven't known that blank has earned the honor of the Trimerian line door. Um, and then this blank day of blank, and there's two little lines, I kind of ran out of space at the bottom when I was making this one. So the Crown signature would have to go above the, the lion in this case. So lower level awards, sort of general awards, AOA level awards, um, it, at least in, in Trimaris and Rites, are, are mostly often blank. So these are scrolls that people have created, they have donated to the kingdom. Um, you know, sometimes they are just illumination and they need to have calligraphy added. Sometimes they have the calligraphy and they just need the names filled in. Uh, and so that way uh, the crown has a, a ready supply of, of these scrolls to draw on as they need them. Higher level awards sometimes are blanks. So there, there certainly are some of those grant level awards that we create and try to keep stocked as well. Um, but that, they're more often commissioned. And then your very highest level awards, peerages, counties, uh, dukes, duchesses, uh, and the rose scrolls are pretty much always commissioned. I don't think I've ever seen a blank for one of those, certainly not recently. Now, when I say commissioned, as I note here on the, the uh, slide, Commission doesn't necessarily mean that people are paying for these scrolls, although sometimes they do, um, especially if there's gonna be a lot of expensive materials involved. But most often the scribe is asked if they will provide this, this higher level scroll um, as a gift. So questions about the differences between blanks, which aren't really blank, but you know what I mean? That's the term for them and commission scrolls. Now I know that some kingdoms um, and ran and I'm not sure if this is how West does it or, or not, but I know that some kingdoms will give what's called a promissory note, especially for like AOA level scrolls where that that's a preprint and then you can, and they have a list of scribes who are available for commissions. And so you kind of get the, the generic one when you get the award and then you can, you can have a specific one made for you later on. Uh, we don't typically do that in Trimeris and Meridias. We try to give that custom um, or that individualized scroll without the promissory note. So, okay, so West does the promissory note thing. I think that's more typical of, of kingdoms, not just the West Kingdom, but Western <laughs> kingdoms, I guess. Um, I, I think Mid-Realm does that too. And I think that may be a, um, a function of the size of the kingdom, of the, the population. Um, you know, Meridias and, and Trimeres have smaller populations. And so, uh, it's a little, little easier for us to keep the cases stocked, you know, when we're only giving you know, there might only be six or eight pieces of business at a court. I know some of the larger kingdoms may have way more than that. 
they're trying to move to that blank system. It's rough. Um, Meridia has only did it, I want to say maybe five or six years ago, um, finally moved away from preprints. So, um, all right. So the process that uh, happens for, for scrolls to get from scribes <laughs> to recipients, and again, this is pretty specific to um, Trimaris and Meridia's, but um, I think it's probably somewhat similar other places, is that uh, their majesties decide what awards they're gonna bestow at a particular court. And I could talk a lot about that whole process. Suffice it to say, write recommendation letters, they matter. <laughs> so they come up with a list. Uh, they talk to the person who's in charge in the kingdom of keeping that stock of scroll blanks. In Meridiers, that's called the parchment pursuivant. Here in Trimaris, it's chart signet. Um, and they go through the stock or go through the kingdom cases. Um, and, and pull out uh, particular blanks that hopefully will work for, for the people who are getting those awards. And this is why it's really important for us to try to have a wide variety of blanks in the cases. Because, you know, let's say somebody is getting an award of arms and they have an early period Norse persona, um, and a Viking persona. And all we have in the cases are like super late period Italian Renaissance scrolls. Like it's still it's still a scroll and it still documents that award, but it's not you know it's not as nice for that person as it could be. So we try to keep a good variety. Um, Chart signet then sends those scrolls scroll blanks to the court scribe. Court scribe is going to fill in names at the event when we have events. Remember when we get to used to get to go places? It was nice. I liked leaving. That was fun. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, so right now with all of the online courts, uh, chart signet is typically the person also filling in the names themselves. But uh, when we used to get to go to events, a person would be designa designated as the court scribe at that event. And they would be in charge of making sure all of the people who are on the list are actually at the event and then um, filling in the names on the scrolls for those people. And that way, if you have somebody who's on the list but they're not at the event, we can save that blank and give it to them later, or we can um, use it for somebody else if we need to. And then last but not least, their majesties will sign the awards, uh, sign the scrolls, and sometimes also affix their seals, which are um, just like medieval wax seals. We make them out of plastic now. <laughs> and they have little stick them on the back so we don't have to carry around wax and a candle and stuff. Whether or not to sign their own scrolls and whether or not to seal the scrolls is a decision that's up to each crown. Um, it certainly was a, a period practice for monarchs to not sign their own proclamations. They may have had, not all monarchs were even literate, uh, depending on the time period and then the location. So they may have had a court scribe whose job it was to, to write up everything and then officially sign it in the name of the monarch. So you have some um, of our modern SCA monarchs who are, are not thrilled about their calligraphy skills and they ask the scribes <laughs> to do the names for them. Um, other ones will, will sign their own and then it's up to them. So you'll notice there's kind of a second process here which, which bypasses some of this, which is that uh, if, you know, sometimes we do commission somebody specifically to make a scroll for someone. And again, that's, that's more common with higher level scrolls, but it will happen at lower levels. Um, scrolls as well, you know, if somebody, if somebody's apprentice is getting an AOA, for example, like, and the, the laurel is, you know, good at, at calligraphy and elimination, they'll usually ask to make the, the scroll for that person. So what are the pieces and parts of an SCA scroll? And you will hear this uh, in court when the, um, the crown announces, and again, this is up to, up to individual uh, crowns, whether they will take the time to announce the creators of the scroll or not. Um, some monarchs prefer to just put that information in like a Facebook gallery. But uh, a lot of times you'll hear them announce, you know, calligraphy by so-and-so, illumination by so-and-so. So what are those things? There's basically three things that go into each SCA scroll. We have the lining, which is uh, the design. And in this, uh, the picture that's on the slide here, this is a scroll that's in the process of being lined by uh, the Honorable Lady Gwyneth. So you can see uh, some of it's quite dark. She's gone over that part in pen already, and then some of it's still lighter, and that's, that's still in pencil there. Um, illumination is usually the next step, and that's uh, adding color by a paint or adding gold, anything along those lines. 
And then calligraphy, of course, is the writing that goes on the scroll. Now, um, if somebody does both the lining and the illumination, we usually just lump that all into illumination. But if it's separate people, we'll, we'll separate those elements out. So where do we get our ideas? Where, where do we get our inspiration for all of these different scrolls from? Um, primarily manuscripts, right? So most of the scrolls that you'll see in the SCA, if they have a, a medieval flair to them, will come out of uh, manuscripts. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. But um, books, I think the biggest medieval books are the biggest source for SCA scrolls, whether that's um, Bibles. I mean, medieval Bibles were very heavily ornamented. Um, very, very colorful, very full of, of pictures illustrating all of the, the different stories and, and things in the Bibles. And some of our most famous examples of the Book of Kells, um, the Lindisfarne Bible, that sort of thing, um, are, are uh, examples of Bibles. Also books of hours, which are later period. Um, and those were usually commissioned by rich noble women um, and they, they, will, they would include prayers, they might include uh, biblical excerpts, but they are uh, very, quite small usually, and again, very, very uh, heavily ornamented, very colorful, and the fun part is that uh, a lot of times these patrons would commission the artist to put them and their friends' faces on the figures from the Bible. <laughs> so it was like, it was like biblical fan art, like, you know, like, hey, could you put me in the middle of this Star Trek cast in a Star Trek uniform? It was that, but in the mid Middle Ages, we were always, we've, we've been fans forever. Uh, we also draw inspiration from um, medieval contracts. It's kind of rare to see a scroll in the SCA specifically evoke a particular medieval contract, but our whole idea of scrolls comes out of these medieval contracts, right? So, you know, medieval contracts being a written record of some kind of agreement or some kind of award. Um, and those typically were, were just uh, writing only. They, they usually didn't have uh, illustrations on them. Uh, letters or, or missiles, um, again, uh, usually writing only, but sometimes would have some kind of illustration or example on them. Medieval art in general uh, is a, um, can be an inspiration as well. You know, we might draw inspiration from paintings or sculpture, that sort of thing. And then um, non-manuscript inspirations for scribal illuminations include things like runestones. So um, a lot of the, the Norse cultures would um, inscribe stories and, and, and tales of great deeds on runestones, and we can kind of transcribe those onto paper. Uh, you'll see people lift designs from uh, Greek pottery, for example. Um, jewelry, I, I use a lot of, of jewelry, especially like Frankish jewelry in my illuminations. So pretty easy to, to trace and color in. <laughs> Um, you might see architecture show up. Um, so again, there's, there's a really, really wide range of, of inspirations for, for scribal art. Um, a lot of people get into scribal art by um, tracing, you, you can buy, um, just lost the word, coloring books. <laughs> coloring books that have like medieval designs and stuff in them. They might, you know, take a, you know, a, a panel from a medieval church and kind of simplify it down or a stained glass window or something like that. And so a lot of people get into it that way. So it's not necessarily drawing inspiration directly from a medieval source, but it's kind of, of doing it a, you know, at, a, at a remove there. So where do we find all that stuff? Um, there are so many libraries and universities that have these incredible digital collections online. Um, Google Translate does pretty well <laughs> at uh, helping you through these collections. So, you know, uh, if you if you're looking for a particular style of manuscript or if you're looking for, um, you know, particular types of inspiration, there, there's so much out there and it can be really difficult to navigate sometimes. And that's where making a scribal friend who has already uh, dove into some of these these archives can help you because they can kind of show you how to navigate the stuff. Uh, you also, a lot of books will have um, detailed photos of manuscripts in them, and so people tend to amass quite large collections. The uh, Trimeris scribes have a library of books that, that will travel to um, different events, especially kingdom level events, that you can look through for inspiration when we get to go places again. And again, um, if you have 
friends who, who do a lot of Scrabble work, they probably have books that you can borrow. <laughs> Um, traceables, as I mentioned, coloring books are a place to look for that. There's also uh, various um, Pinterest boards and websites and things. Uh, Veronica has just added, she's um, Parchment over in Meridia's. She has just added a ton of traceable stuff to the Meridia's Scribes website, which I'll link you guys in a minute, um, that came out of, I can't remember where Jawig is from. Might be the West Kingdom, actually. I can't remember. I'll look it up in a minute. And then I get a lot of stuff off of Pinterest, honestly, but you do have to be careful to double check the information because people will just post pictures of stuff without any um, citation. Um, so you can't be sure that it is what it looks like or they'll, you know, they, they might get the citation information wrong because they might have copied it off of a different part of the page or something. So just to be sure if you get stuff on Pinterest, it's a good idea to double check and make sure that it is what it says it is. But I, I mean, yeah, I, I think Pinterest is great for, um, especially for non-manuscript sources, you know, I find all kinds of, of jewelry and, um, uh, you know, metalwork and pottery and tiles and, and, and anything along those lines, I think, um, are so easy to find on Pinterest. All right, so questions about where we get our ideas and kind of where to find them or any uh, advice from those of you um and if ellen's still online yeah ellen has mad pinterest boards for all of this stuff so <laughs> you can always talk to her she can be your scribal buddy <laughs> well, links would be great ellen um so my question was i am new to all of this um but i am super interested in getting started um, but are there any sort of rules or not necessarily hard and fast rules, but are there, I guess, ethics between what you copy directly versus how you alter it to make it your own? I'm a college librarian. So again, mm. like copyright is something that yeah. <laughs> I guess I want to make sure like what is maybe frowned upon, I guess, public domain, it's very old, but still, are there any stuff within SCA to follow? That's a great question. Um, and it's one of the reasons I personally like to try to stay with medieval exemplars rather than using things like coloring books. Um, because a lot of, you know, a lot of the coloring books, a lot of the traceables that are out there are not in the public domain, you know, even though they might be sort of copying something that that transformation of it is then copyrighted. Um, and so uh, I think that's where you can get into some of those sticky situations in general in the SDA, as long as you are crediting that work. Um, it's usually, you know, we're, we're usually kind of okay with that. But again, like I said, I, you know, for me, I'm just like, I'll just go back to the source and trace that instead. <laughs> so that kind of gets me out of that, that situation personally. Oh, okay. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure. I would hate to, mm -hmm. you know, start to get involved, submit a scroll for an award and they're saying, hey, you just traced or copy, you just, you know, use this manuscript as a reference, you know, we're not, you're disqualified. Absolutely not. So like I said, uh, you know, modern um, reimaginings or, um, you know, designs that are under modern copyright. So you see there's a lot of like uh, Celtic coloring books out there, for example, where people yeah. have put together Celtic knot work and stuff. And some of those are, you know, they're like, yeah, use this for whatever. And then some of them, you know, you just have to check to make sure that you're on the right side of, of the law on that one. Um, but in terms of going back to medieval manuscripts, going back to, to any sort of um, public domain design, trace them, absolutely do it. Tracing is period. Uh, <laughs> you know, people in our, our time period copied, traced, altered things all the time. They, they plagiarized without even thinking about it. So, <laughs> so that is a period practice, do it. <laughs> Don't do it to, to modern things. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and Ellen's pasting some of her, her links there, um, her Pinterest stuff in the chat for you guys as well. Thank you, Ellen. I threw you under the bus there. <laughs> Um, some common types, and before I get into this, a caveat, um, there are so, so, so many different types of, of scroll work in the SCA, and these are absolutely not the only ones. These are just the ones that I see most often and that I could find easy examples for. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't want anybody to go like, well, you know, Jessica did, you know, Jessica says this wasn't on her list, so it's not a real thing. Nope. <laughs> um, 
So, but these are these are some common types of scrolls that you will see in the SCA. You'll see um, bar and ivy, Celtic, illuminated capitals, white work, Romanesque, Eastern, Middle Eastern, Cadells, and then um, various black and white drawings. And I'm going to give you examples of um, each of these except the black and white drawings because I forgot to make that slide and I didn't realize it until right before class. <laughs> All right, here's one of the most common types of scrolls you see in the SCA. Uh, it's called bar and ivy, named cleverly because it typically features one or more bars and some ivy. We are nothing if not creative. <laughs> bar and ivy is a middle to late period uh, technique. Um, as you'll see, uh, and these are two examples from Gwyneth. One of these might actually be the one that I showed you earlier that she was lining, I'm not sure. Um, she does a lot of this type of work. The, the picture there in the middle is a, an extant, a, a period example um, that's out of, I think that one's out of a Bible. So you'll see uh, around the edge of the page, there's this sort of border constructed of bars. Bar and ivy uh, often would feature very, very detailed miniatures as well. And the miniature is just like a, a very small scene, you know, maybe it's a Bible scene, maybe it's a battle scene. Um, or um, figures of people, you know, little portraits of people, so that you would often have this, you know, the page sort of framed in this, the bar and ivy, and then you'd have this very, very detailed little uh, picture in it as well. For scrolls in the SCA, typically that level of detail uh, you would only see on, on upper level commission scrolls. We don't see a lot of those really detailed miniatures on, um, AOA level and, and general scrolls, um, partly because it's kind of, it's a lot of work. And, you know, we're, we're trying to turn out as many scrolls as we can, but uh, but also because, you know, if you paint a little miniature of a woman, a white woman wearing blue weaving, and then you want to try to give that scroll to somebody who is a person of color, who typically wears red and um, scribes, <laughs> then, you know, that, that scroll becomes very, very specific. So. Like I said, don't see a lot of miniatures in those, but you will see them on, on certainly on commissioned scrolls. Uh, I think the other most common type of word scroll that we see in the SCA are um, Celtic or Norse scrolls, kind of lumping those together, even though they're obviously not the same culture, but they're, um, the art styles are similar, right? So um, all of the, the knot work that you see on scrolls, um, which <laughs> people, I don't know, knot work is something that people like to dive into as new scribes, and I don't recommend that because it's really hard. <laughs> it looks really easy. They're like, oh, it's just painting lines. I can do that. Hmm. Um, I, I always feel like if you can make it through your first knot work scroll <laughs> without wanting to burn it, then you're going to be okay as a scribe. They are deceptively difficult. Um, but um, so, you know, one reason we see a lot of these types of scrolls is because they're easier to do in some respects um, because they are block colors and they don't have any shading typically. Um, they're easier to, to paint as a new scribe, um, you know, because you, you don't have to worry about like, does this look like a person? You know, where's the shadows in this? It's just, you know, red, done. Um, they, uh, we also, of course, have quite a lot of, of Norse um, and early period personas in the SCA. And so the, these are good ones to keep on stock. And we also have a couple of amazing, amazing exemplars to draw from, which are the Book of Kells. And that um, picture in the middle of the page there is a uh, part of, is, is an example out of the Book of Kells. Um, and also uh, the Lindisfarne Gospels, which the uh, one on the left side of the, the screen there um, by Veronica um, is, uh, I think that one's inspired by Lindisfarne. So, um, and those, and we, those are fully digitized and you can find examples of them everywhere. And so, so we, there's a lot of inspiration to draw from. And of course, there's all sorts of other um, things to draw from in that time period too. I do a lot of um, jewelry based ones, um, you know, there's all these brooches and pins and stuff. Uh, but again, lots of examples there. We also see quite a lot of illuminated capitals. Oh, look, it's, Dame Ellen DeLacy. <laughs> um, and, and so these are ones that typically, rather than having like a full, you know, full border, or full illumination, we'll just kind of eliminate a capital and then the rest is calligraphy. Uh, you'll notice in Ellen's scroll there, the calligraphy is also uh, artistic. Um, and that was part of uh, 
the exemplar as well had those different colors and, and sort of types of, of hands there. But um, I, I, I called it all time periods because um, <laughs> you can kind of do an eliminated cap, you know, you can do like a, a letter out of the Book of Kells and then do, you know, the, the rest of the calligraphy based on that. You can do a, a late period, um, sort of, as you see in this one by um, Catriona and Veronica on the right. You can do a much later period style of letter. Uh, and this is where some of those traceables are really nice too, because we have, you know, people have digitized a lot of those eliminated capitals throughout time and they're really easy to find on Pinterest. Um, I know Ellen has some on her board, I have some on mine, and uh, they're really easy to trace and then fill in and then, you know, somebody else can do the calligraphy or you can. So they're a great way to get started. Uh, white work. Um, this isn't technically a different style of scroll, but it's just something that I wanted to point out. Um, you see a lot of white work in, um, in conjunction with Bar and Ivy and the example on the left side there, another one of Ellen's with Veronica's calligraphy. Um, and then the example in the middle is, is of course from a manuscript, but you can do white work without Bar and Ivy, which is why I, I decided to include it separately. And that the one on the right is one of mine um, there that I personally do not like Bar and Ivy, nothing against it but I hate painting all those little leaves and lining all those little leaves drives me crazy. Not going to do it. So, <laughs> um, so I, sometimes I'll do white work, uh, without the, the other stuff. Um, white work is just as, a, as, a, as you can see, and as the name implies, uh, painting very delicate designs in white, sometimes other colors, sometimes you'd see it in gold, but most often white, uh, on top of a block of color. My theory, <laughs> is that they started doing it because um, some of these colors would streak as you were painting in these blocks and they just want to kind of cover up the imperfections. So it's like, let's distract them with little white lines. Uh, Romanesque is another somewhat common type. There's, uh, again, a lot of um, examples of stuff that are fairly easy to, to copy. We start to get here more into uh, shading as a technique and more into um, kind of layering different colors. And so it, it, it's a little more difficult than some of those earlier types. But uh, as you can see, you can make some really quite lovely uh, scrolls and designs out of them. Um, oops, I forgot to credit Catrion on that one. I threw in black hours here. So book of our books of hours again are, are later period. And I mentioned those are the sort of um, illustrations of, of biblical stuff or, or of other things with prayers. Um, there was a very, very specific time period. We actually only have, I think, seven extant manuscripts where a bunch of apparently super gothy medieval people decided, <laughs> what if the page was black? Um, and they would actually dye the parchment with ink and then paint on top of it. Uh, Luckily, we don't have to do that. You will see some people do that sometimes, but um, you can actually just buy black Bristol paper, <laughs> which is pretty sweet. Uh, so the one on the left, um, Katrina the Blind uh, did the illumination on that one. And that is, that's actually based on um, an extant uh, medieval example. And then the one on the right is one of mine. Um, I did the colleague on, on Katrina's as well. Black hours are, are fun because they're just kind of different. There's a question in the chat that says, how difficult is it to paint on the black? Um, just about to get to that. <laughs> so here's where having good paint really matters. Um, some of the uh, cheaper, the student level paints um, are more difficult because you have to do multiple layers. Um, if you, yeah, so if you, so, and, and the gold and stuff, I don't know how many times Katriana had to go over uh, her eliminations. I had really good gold paint on mine, so I didn't have to do, I think I just did two layers. But um, uh, yeah, so it's a, I think it's a little more difficult, but, uh, but if you have good paint, then it's not, I haven't had a problem with it. And Ellen's got a board of black hours. So she said them in the chat. So go check out her Pinterest. Uh, I have lumped Eastern <laughs> into one category, which is not okay. But uh, in terms of the SCA, we don't see a lot of Eastern scrolls. Um, and so here we go. Um, so Eastern and here I'm including um, basically all time periods and anything in East Asia, China, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, 
the example on the left uh, is um, Master Thomas did the the illumination on that, and of course that's based on um, Chinese artwork styles, and the the person in it is the recipient. So this uh, this is for Uyang, and this is her oboe, um, and then uh, Mara did the calligraphy, and that is actually uh, Chinese there that was translated by Bernhard. Uh, the one on the right is a writ that I did for um, Master Upla. This was his writ for the um, Lord of the Pelican, and it's uh, Mongolian, which I do not speak or write. <laughs> so I used a translator, and then I traced it. <laughs> but I did design the thing in the middle. That says Ukla in bolded script, so I'm pretty, pretty proud of that. If you don't know, um, Ukla is not his real SCA name, but it's what everybody calls him. <laughs> Uh, other common types, um, Middle Eastern or uh, Islamic, um, Arabic, and then again, kind of all time periods. So um, the uh, one on the left there, uh, Lady Sifa, who she, oh, no, nope, Kisa and Kala here, I don't see Sifa, <laughs> um, lined this one, and then uh, Veronica painted it and did the calligraphy on it. And then the one on the right there is a Mara Cat collaboration. So, um, and what you can see on both of these, I don't know how closely you can see the, the writing. Neither of these, of course, are actually written in Arabic. They're written in what's called a faux hand. Um, so a lot of times, you know, unlike the previous one, for example, which that is actually uh, written in Chinese, as far as I know, um, uh, these are written in English, and then we just kind of design the letters to, to evoke that Arabic uh, style. And um, if you want to start a fight, go into any scribal group and be like, hey, what do you guys think about faux hands? People have opinions. <laughs> uh, some people are very opposed. Some people are very for. Um, it, I, 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 I think it's amazing. Uh, getting into the later period, Cadell's, uh, these are sort of calligraphy only, although you'll notice in the one on the right, Maestro Isabella did tuck a few little bear sketches in there. Um, one on the left is another Mara production. This is a matched pair of AOAs for a couple. So Cadell's are just you know, very, very ornately designed capitals um, that uh, you know are done strictly with a calligraphy pen. And I mentioned, um, like I said, I, I, I didn't do the black and white one um, and I meant to, but uh, you also see later period, we start to get printed books um, as uh, examples. And so, um, especially for fencing awards, rapier cut and thrust awards, there's a lot of fencing manuals in late period that were printed and they have um, drawings of people fencing each other. And so those are great sources to draw on for those scrolls. Um, we also start to see uh, woodblock prints um, and printed books appear and you can, you can draw on those as well for inspiration. I pasted one of those in the chat. Thank you. A woodblock example in the chat. This is great, Ellen. I should have you as a teaching assistant always. <laughs> All right, so before we get into materials, questions about examples, types, where we get our ideas, some of the different styles. <laughs> All right. Oops. So what materials do you need to get started? Well, you need um, substrates, which are things to write on. And I'm not calling that paper because it doesn't always mean paper more in a, minute, more in a second. Uh, you need inks to draw and write with. You need pigments to color with. You need tools to do things with. And you might need gold or other extra bits to make things shiny. So let's briefly go through some of each of these. Uh, period materials for substrates. Um, most of our extant manuscripts and materials and scrolls um, and things are on parchment, which is stretched, scraped, and cured animal skin. And you can see in the um, bottom left picture there, the, the thing drying on the rack there, that's parchment being stretched as it dries so that it will dry flat. Um, one of the reasons that most of our examples that we have are on parchment is it's extremely durable. It can uh, last a thousand years or more um, if kept under or uh, the right conditions. Unlike, for example, papyrus, which um, is a, a, a reed that's been flattened, um, sort of unrolled and flattened out, 
And that top picture there is an example of, and this is where we get that this the word scroll and the idea of a scroll um, is that because papyrus is so fragile, um, it was stored, rolled up like this, and you would unroll sections of it to read it. Uh, and then paper, of course, comes to comes to Europe later in period. Uh, in Asia, they have been using paper since like the second century. Um, and that was typically made from um, fiber from mulberry trees, bark from mulberry trees. And then of course, uh, later in period in Europe, um, we start to incorporate cloth fibers and uh, cellulose fibers and stuff into that. If you are interested in learning how to make paper, there's a guy in my barony here in Trimeris, I am blanking on his name, but he's a, a Laurel, he's a master of paper making, really amazing stuff and he teaches classes. I'll try to remember. I haven't, been, I haven't lived in Florida very long. I don't know everybody's SCA names very well. <laughs> Thank you, Master Barar. Thank you. Um, yeah, he's phenomenal. Uh, period inks would include uh, carbon or lamp black ink. And the reason it's called lamp black is because, you know, when you when you would light a lamp, the, the black that would collect on the inside of the glass, um, the, the soot, they would collect that and, and turn it into ink. Uh, iron gall, uh, or you'll hear it called oak gall ink because it's um, you make it with oak galls and iron. And that other picture with the blue background there is of galls growing on an oak tree. So you uh, harvest those. They're actually the result of a um, parasite. And through some kind of process, turn it into ink. I don't know how. Ask Mr. Sedella. She makes it. <laughs> uh, and then if you see red ink on scrolls, not red paint, but ink, although I guess also the paint, that's usually vermilion, which is a, um, something oxide. It's a, it's a metal. Um, and again, that would be turned into ink. Period pigments, period paints would include um, pigments, and those would be uh, minerals or plant pigments, you know, ground up um, lapis lazuli for blue, for example. Um, you might have a different uh, matter, which is a, um, a plant pigment. And then you would mix it with a binder, something to, to get it to stick to the page. Usually uh, they would use um, egg, egg whites or um, gum arabic, grind up the gum arabic and dissolve it in water and use that. And that's actually uh, fairly similar to how paints are made now. They're, you know, you have a, a pigment and you mix it with a binder. For tools, uh, pens, you would use quills, um, so the feathers of, of birds, and, um, and you would have to have a knife. A little, where's my little pen knife? A sharp little knife. Put it in front of my face so it doesn't disappear into my virtual background. <laughs> you would need to trim those quills um, 50 or so times a day because they, they get dull quite quickly. And of course, paint brushes, uh, which would be made of, of wood and um, hair. And then if you are leafing, you would need a uh, gold leaf. Silver was used, but it tends to turn black. Uh, sometimes tin was used. It, it didn't oxidize as quickly. Um, and then, uh, or you might uh, use what's called shell gold, which is just gold, pig, gold um, powdered gold flakes mixed with binders the same way that you would for other pigments. Now, do you have to have all of that stuff to make scrolls in the SCA? No, of course not. That would be ruinously expensive. <laughs> so we use paper. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just disappeared. That's funny. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the primary um, The primary uh, uh, substrate for SCA scrolls is Bristol. First, you'll hear it called Bristol board or Bristol paper. It's a little bit thicker than cardstock. Um, it's very smooth. There are two finishes on it. Um, one's called smooth and one's called vellum. I have yet to be able to distinguish the difference between the two. You will hear people swear by one or the other. I think they're lying. <laughs> the other type of paper you'll see used a lot in the SCA is called pergaminata. You can't tell the difference on the screen, but I assure you they are different. Perg is thinner. It's a, um, it's a vegetable paper, but it's made to resemble parchment as much as possible so that you can, you don't have to have actual animal skin to make scrolls that look like they're on parchment. It functions and it um, works like parchment a lot as well in that the, rather than soaking into the page, the inks and the parchments kind of sit on top of it. So it just behaves a little differently. Some people will use wa watercolor paper. Um, watercolor paper works great for paints. It is not as good for calligraphy. If you're gonna use watercolor paper, paper hot press, watercolor paper is the way to go, which unfortunately is the one that's harder to find. 
cold press is what's in all the stores. So um, Bristol is actually just easier to find than hot press watercolor. For pigments, um, we strongly recommend uh, gouache or watercolor, uh, opaque watercolor. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, uh, gouache is as close is the closest um, analogous to those medieval pigments. Um, two, you definitely don't want to use something like acrylic because especially here in the south where it never really dries, acrylic is going to stick um, to other. So when, when um, they've got the scrolls, the different pieces of paper in the kingdom stock, in the kingdom cases, um, if it's acrylic, they're going to stick to each other. And so you're not only going to ruin your scroll, but potentially somebody else's. So you really want to stick to those um, flat pigments like gouache and watercolor. For inks, uh, you can also start uh, a, probably not a, a war, but a discussion certainly in any SCA scribal group by, by asking about inks. Everybody's got their own favorite. Basically, you just want anything that's going to be archival and that's not going to fade in the sun because some people do like to, to frame their scrolls and put them up. And then uh, we can, of course, still use gold leaf to, to gild our scrolls, and a lot of people do. Um, I don't because one, it's quite expensive, and two, I'm just not that good at it. So I, like many of us, use gold paint. And there's some, some good gold paint brands out there too. Uh, so here is the process that most of us follow when we're actually making scrolls. Uh, we start with the design. Again, tracing is period. Don't be afraid to do it. Uh, if you are going to add gold leaf, you do it before you paint. And it's because it's going to stick to anything on the page that has the slightest bit of humidity in it. So if you paint first and then gild, you're going to have gold all over your paint. So gild first, then, then paint, then calligraphy. And this is, again, how most of us will do it. Um, and a lot of people will only do illumination. Um, and so then they send their, their scrolls off to, to have calligraphy added by someone else. Sometimes I'll do calligraphy first, um, just for funds. Sometimes I'll switch back and forth. Do what works for you. <laughs> So what do you need to get started? I, I gave you a whole list of materials earlier. That's a lot of stuff. Um, here is what I recommend. If you uh, are super duper getting started and you don't want to waste your Bristol um, while, while you're practicing on stuff, 110 pound cardstock is pretty good uh, as, a, as an analogy and is cheaper. You can buy a pack of it for, for cheaper. Um, and then again, you can, and you can find that at Michael's um, Hobby Lobby, any pretty much, you know, if you have a Dick Blick, any of the um, art stores will have this stuff. Uh, cardstock is less good for practicing calligraphy. It's better than just paper, um, but it's not as good as Bristol because Bristol does have that smooth finish on it. And Bristol's pretty easy to find. And uh, Michael's will put it on sale every once in a while. Hold, hold out for those sales. If I want to get one, free sales are choice. <laughs> Uh, in terms of inks and pens, uh, if you, for lining, for again doing that design work, um, anything archival, a lot of people use the Micron pens, the sort of beige colored, I don't have one because I don't like them, but um, this is the color, I guess, this is, a, this is not one of them, but, um, but any, you know, any, any art pens will work there. If you're doing calligraphy, um, dip pens or cartridge pens, don't use the calligraphy markers because um, that ink is not archival. It will fade and it will fade really quickly. So uh, it's just not even worth spending the money on. But cartridge pens are pretty OK. Those are pens that have a little um, internal reservoir of ink that kind of snaps into it. And then the ink flows out through the end of the pen. And you don't have to um, keep dipping it in a little ink well. If you are going to use a dip pen, which we'll be talking about obviously in the next hour, <laughs> you will need a nib holder. Uh-oh, my internet connection is unstable. Um, can you guys still? Hmm? You're good now. OK. So if you're going to do, if you're going to use dip pens, you will need a nib holder. You will need nibs. I definitely recommend also some type of little container. This is called a dinky dip um, to pour some of your ink into rather than trying to dip it into the, the bottle, because the bottles will a lot of times have narrow necks, and it can be hard to get the um, uh, what's it called? The, the nib in there without getting it all over your hands. <laughs> uh, 
For paints, um, student grade gouache or opaque watercolor is fine. Obviously not the dollar store watercolors, but you know, pretty much again, anything you would buy at Michael's, even the, the lower level stuff. Unfortunately, apparently Reeves has, has discontinued their student grade line, which is what we always recommended. It's very cheap. Um, if you don't get a full set and you're just buying individual colors, you want basically the primary colors plus I recommend green and brown. It's just easier to have those separately than have to mix them every time. Um, and then of course, white and black. And if you're looking at different shades of red or yellow and trying to figure out which red do I buy, which yellow do I buy, the, the recommendation that was given to me, and I think it's great, is um, condiment colors. So don't choose like fire engine red, choose ketchup red. Don't choose lemon yellow, choose mustard yellow, because those are closer to those pigment periods, or those um, period pigments. <laughs> For tools, you want paint brushes with very small um, ends on them. So the, the zero level paint brushes, trust me, you will use them constantly. And I like um, these, these are the miniature painting, you know, for painting little miniature figures, paint brushes, because they have a, um, a thing in the middle that you can really grip. I like to be able to, um, but any, again, any student grade paint brushes are fine. Um, you will want a ruler. Uh, I recommend, you know, um, assembling a, a variety of different circles to trace. Um, you may also want shields if you're going to make a lot of scrolls that have shield shapes on them. Um, a little palette is useful, but you can just use like a plate or whatever. And then um, pencils, and they need to you need to have white eraser. So mechanical pencils are great for this. The white eraser isn't going to mark up your page. Sorry, I'm kind of running through the, this, this stuff really quickly since I'm low on time. Um, there's a question about what brand of miniature paintbrush. I just searched for like miniature painting paintbrushes and picked a couple of different types to try them out. I don't have a brand recommendation, sorry. Uh, Cal, Cal Barter does though. So a couple of things to know about making award scrolls. Your requirements on an award scroll are the name of the recipient, the name of the award, the date of the award, and the name of the people who gave the award. Those are the only things that are required so um, don't get stressed about the wording. Uh, every kingdom has their suggested wording. Some kingdoms do, do have more requirements that you use it, but certainly not Meridies or Trimeris. So you can make up your own. Leave a one inch margin around the edge of your scrolls so that people can frame them. Things to avoid. Do not use any religious iconography or religious wording. Um, those cannot be read into court when they cannot be shown in court because that would be against SCA policies. Any hate speech symbols, I know this sounds obvious, but um, because swastikas only became hate speech symbols in the 20th century, they are everywhere <laughs> in medieval manuscripts and they hide in patterns a lot. There's a lot of times I've found like, oh, that would make a cool scroll. And then I'm like, swastikas, dang. <laughs> um, so just watch out for those. Uh, I recommend not using overtly modern or out of period designs unless it serves a specific purpose. Um, for example, I know Catriona does a scroll for the Toys for Tots tournament in Iron Mountain every year and she'll put little toys on it and it's cute. Um, and just as always be careful with humor, right? Uh, good advice from Rihanna in there, try to make it frameable in a standard size. So if you can make the design of your scroll itself fit like an eight by 10 or a five by seven or et cetera, um, it's a lot easier that people don't have to have a mat cut. Um, and think creatively, you can think outside the box. Not everything has to be the standard. Here's a border, here are lines. Um, here's a scroll that Countess Thorkatla did based on um, a musical sheet. Here's one that Mara did that's um, based on kind of Islamic calligraphy styles, sort of rolling all the calligraphy into designs. Uh, here's one that I did that's actually a, a sword rack that I painted up with the scroll on it. <laughs> so you don't even necessarily have to work on paper. And some resources for you. And at that, I'm going to leave it. <laughs> Questions real quick. <laughs> I guess we can run into the next time because that's also my class. Well, I hope that uh, you all learned some stuff. Um, even if you maybe didn't have a lot of background in this before, hopefully you have at least an appreciation for, for what scribes uh, put together um, in service to our kingdoms and our baronies. 
And uh, if you were interested in getting started, I, I hope that this has taken you another step down that path. And uh, we're always ask any scribe, we will we will throw paint at you, not like throw paint at you, but uh, we will give you yeah, supplies. We will. Yeah, we also will do that too. We will give you supplies. We will we will help you with anything. So, so I have a group. I'm going to share that scroll and scrabble group. Okay, thanks. I'm going to um, end the recording um, and then I'll do the drawing. So just give me a second.